talk a little bit about the history of the IETF. IETF sort of started before the IETF started. It started with a network working group. The network working group was formed in about 1968, sort of an ad hoc group that was, according to a description in RFC3, concerned with host software, the strategies for using the network, and the initial experiments with the network. This was established before even the ARPANET was rolled out. The, the name, Network Working Group, lived on in RFCs up until 2009, even though the Network Working Group pretty much disappeared within, certainly within a decade of when it was formed. But it's the, in, it's the furthest back antecedent of the IETF. RFC 1, by Steve Crocker pictured, uh, was host software. And in a, that was done in April of 69. Uh, and John Postel became the RFC editor at the same time. In 1969, October, the ARPANET started to be deployed. The first four nodes of the ARPANET were deployed. 1974, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, uh, Vint, Vint shown there, uh, published the first version of TCPIP uh, called ITCP. And then Vint, in 1979, formed the Internet Configuration Control Board to guide the technical evolution of the Internet Protocol Suite. That was, uh, he was then, Vint was then the program manager for the ARPANET at, the, at DARPA, at the Defense Department. The chair of the ICCB was Dave Clark from MIT, pictured below. Later on, and in 1983, January 1st, 1983, the ARPANET switched to supporting TCP IP and turned off NCP. And also in 83, the ICCB was reorganized into the Internet Advisory Board, the IAB. Barry Liner, who was then the ARPANET program manager, had taken over for Vint, um, set this up. There were 10 research task forces at that point. Here's a list of them. They all reported to the IAB. In 1986, the Internet Advisory Board was reorganized into the Internet Activities Board, keeping the acronym IAB. This was done by Dennis Parry, who was then the ARPANET program manager, and there were seven task forces, Internet Engineering being one of them. The first meeting that we identify as an IATF meeting was in January of 1986. There were 20 attendees at Linkabit in San Diego, California. And the mission of this task force, the IATF, is to identify and resolve engineering issues in the near-term planning and the operation of DOD Internet, which was then, uh, by then, the TCPIP Internet. The goal of the effort is to improve and expand the service for its operational users, including gateway systems and various networks operated on behalf of all users, such as ARPANET and MILNET. So this was the beginning of what the, what's became the IETF. The list of attendees in the, is, is shown there and the particular points of interest in that first meeting are shown there. These are both from the proceedings of the first meeting, which are online. In 1989, the IAB, still called the Internet Activities Board, was reorganized yet again, and this time reduced to two task forces, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, and the Internet Research Task Force, IRTF, both of which are still going on. Also in 89, the Internet Engineering Steering Group and Internet Research Steering Groups were formed. The IAB membership and the Steering Group membership were appointed by the leaderships of those. So the IAB membership was selected by the chair of the IAB. The study group memberships were picked by the IAB. IAB had a bunch of roles. The Vint Cerf was the uh, chair of the IAB. Phil Gross was the chair of the IETF. And Dave Clark was the chair of the IRTF. The IAB approved the technical standards, managed the RFC publication, reviewed the operations of the various groups, uh, did planning, worked on policy, did a lot of stuff. In 1992, a big change. The Internet Society was formed. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The IAB met in Kobe, Japan, after an Internet Society INET 92 meeting. And the IAB reorganized itself to form the Internet Architecture Board. So they renamed themselves. They, got, they agreed to a charter and be chartered by the Internet Society. And they increased the role of the IESG in standards development, but they were still a standards approval body. The picture there 
is the cover of the Internet Society's INET 92 brochure. After that meeting, the IAB published a, a internet draft called IP version 7. It, this draft recommended an immediate IETF effort to prepare a detailed technical and organizational plan for using CLNP as the basis for IPv7. IPv7, a successor to IPv4, in other words, the future of the internet. This didn't go over terribly well. Uh, the community, the IETF community, got really pretty annoyed that the IAB had made what appeared to be a definitive statement about the future of the internet without involving the community. They had made it on their own. So this got involved a very heated discussion in the IETF community, starting at the IETF meeting in Cambridge, Massachusetts in uh, July of 1992. That's the cover of the proceedings of that, of that meeting. So the, the discussions involved around who makes decisions for the IETF? Is this a community thing, or is this the IAB making decisions for the community? And how best to involve, evolve the internet protocol? The, IET, the IAB's plan was to move to CLMP, the OSI protocol, as a basis for the next generation internet. Um, many people in the IETF community wanted a next generation internet protocol rather than a previous generation OSI protocol. In the aftermath of the what has been now called the Kobe incident, where the IAB picked the OSI protocol as the future of the Internet. Vint Cerf called for a new IETF working group to examine the future of the IETF, how the different processes worked, what in general, how we should in general go forward. A poised working group was formed with Steve Crocker as chair, the same Steve Crocker that wrote RFC 1. The result of that was a restructured IETF and IEB, and that the membership in the IETF management committees, the IAB and the IESG, and the IA, uh, were no, no longer selected by the chairs of those, but went to a committee-based selections process. And the structure we've had since 1992 is working groups organized into areas, areas managed by area directors. Those area directors are picked by a nomcom. The area directors plus the IETF chair, also picked by a nomcom, form the IESG. The IESG runs the IETF. It is the standards review body. It's the standards approval body. Took over from the IAB for that function. The IAB still exists, and it provides architectural advice and relationships with outside, the outside world, but does no longer involved in the approval of standards. And all of these folks are picked by a nomcom rather than heredity, and rather than picked by the chairs. Now let's go back and look at the, uh, the Internet Society a little bit. I mentioned the Internet Society a couple of slides ago, but the Internet Society, one of the starts was on October 26, uh, 1989, had a small meeting at the uh, CNRI, Corporation for National Research Initiatives in Reston, Virginia. Uh, it was Vint and um, Phil Gross and a bunch of other of us sitting around a table talking about liability of various people on the internet. And a lawyer mentioned that Vint and Phil, as the leadership in the IETF, were individually and personally responsible for the liability of the standards process of the IETF, which sort of woke the people up and that liability is a bad thing to have. Uh, Following that meeting, and for other reasons as well, uh, Vint and Bob Kahn, who was the, the chair of, the C of CNRI and previously had been at DARPA, uh, for talked about forming an Internet Society, a, a something to offload liability and to provide other functions. August 30th, 1991, ISOC was announced. The Internet Society for Board first met in Kobe, Japan, June 15, 1992. That was the meeting that I mentioned earlier. We have a meeting the IAB met afterwards. On December 11, 1992, the ISOC was incorporated as a 501c3 tax-exempt organization in Washington, D.C. The original purpose for the Internet Society was to support the Internet technical evolution, particularly supporting the IAB and IETF, Internet Society offered to be the IETF's legal home 
and to provide insurance, uh, an insurance liability shield. The Internet Society also ran meetings and conferences, in particular the INET conference, which had been started earlier by Larry Landweber, and that was the meeting in, in, in 92. Uh, INET conferences were a way for bringing researchers and technical people from around the world and teaching them about how to configure routers and how to build networks. And, the, and third, thirdly, the Internet Society provided information about technology progress relating to the Internet in that they published a technical newsletter. The ISOC board originally had three charter members. Those three charter members were, had permanent memberships and they could veto any change in the bylaws. This became a sore point with the IETF and the IETF, even though the Internet Society had made the offer to be the legal home for the IETF, the IETF actually didn't consider the possibility because they saw the Internet Society board as being dominated by these three charter members. In 1996, the board was reorganized and the charter memberships ended. At that point, the IETF felt it was reasonable to accept the Internet Society's offer to be legal housing and the ISOC purchased insurance for all of the IETF decision makers, which involved the IESG, the IAB, the working group chairs, uh, NOMCOM members, folks like that. Folks who make a decision are covered by ISOC purchased insurance. The IETF doesn't legally exist. It is described as an organized activity of the Internet Society. That's the text off the IETF homepage, for example. There's no independent legal standing of the Internet, so Internet Engineering Task Force. Later on, in 2005, the IETF expanded its dependence on the Internet Society. Uh, at, um, in that general time frame, it became clear that the existing mechanisms of having CNRI be the secretariat for the IETF was not going to be a long-term solution and the IETF needed to come up with a way to control its own budget and to administer its own processes. And so a working group was formed and after a great deal of discussion, RFC 4071, otherwise known as BCP 101, was adopted, which moved all of the funding support for the IETF into the Internet Society and created an administrative support activity, the IASA. And this is uh, the IASA worries about the budgets and things like that. And that operates under the IETF Administrative Oversight Committee, the IAOC. The IOC membership is the IETF and IAB chairs, the president of the Internet Society, and a number of folks that are selected by the IETF, the NOM, IETF NOMCOM, the IAB, and the Internet Society board. The, picture here is of BCP 101, the cover page of BCP 101. Originally, the Internet Society was a direct membership organization, individual members. John Postel was the first individual member of the Internet Society. Uh, in, in 2002, the Internet Society bid for and won the right to the .org top-level domain and it did so with a new organization, new subsidiary organization called the Public Interest Registry. It has become the, ma the major funding source for the Internet Society. It's not the only funding source, but it's a major funding source. And in 2003, the board selection process was revised, moved away from individual memberships to trustees selected by the IETF, the chapters, the, IETF, the Internet Society chapters, and organizational members companies or organizations that pay a fee to be a member of the Internet Society. That's the other major funding source for the Internet Society is these organizational members. So these three communities elect trustees or the chapters and the organizational members elect trustees and the trustees, uh, the IETF selects trustees uh, to, be, to make up the ISOC board. The IETF funding the meeting and publications uh, were supported by the U.S. government until, until 1997. Then in 2001, some uh, initially small $100 meeting free was charged. That was increased later on. The text in the proceedings say that the original fee was um, 
the fee was initiated to defray some of the IETF meeting costs. But later on, it became clear that this was also a reasonable way to raise funds to help support the secretariat. So the meeting fee was raised, and the meeting fee covers more than just the cost of the meeting now. It helps pay for the secretariat. Internet Society started funding in reality and significant amounts in 1995. Meanwhile, shortly thereafter, the U.S. government stopped all funding. Currently, the I Internet Society provides a, a, a chunk of the funding, but all of the funds run through the Internet Society's banks. The, the meeting fees, plus sponsorships of the meetings, plus the Internet Society, together cover the costs of running the IETF.